We did this one, right? We got another this one. Yeah. Yeah. With uh, Rush, YYZ, a great tune, man. But just, you know how hard that is to play on the bass? Holy crap. Okay, let's keep uh, let's keep rolling. What? Uh, <laughs> we talked about, let me back it up. We won't do the, uh, I hate this, the little dim come back, dim come back. I need to adjust the slides. I hate that. We were talking about two recurring themes. The first one was abstraction, right? And we ended with what I was doing on the, on the lawn at Google. <coughs> Apparently commuting with the universe in both directional abstractions. And then the other one was this hardware software interdependence with the theme that that kind of kicks up in the book. And so, I want to kind of hit this just a little bit. Um, so, I want to just say, I do think the author, this is one area where the book is a little bit um, outdated, maybe just a little bit. Uh, there is an interconnection between hardware and software. Over time, that interconnection has gotten weaker. And what I mean, there's there's still a point at which hardware and software interact, and that's kind of the area where we're kind of playing. We're going all the way down to transistors. We're going to bring you up to where it starts to look like what you recognize as software, and we're going to stop. Uh, back in the day, there wasn't that much above that. So that intersection was a big piece of territory that you had to worry about. It's now kind of way down there. There was a point where there's some programs where there's uh, out there in universities where there's no compiler class even offered, let alone required. You know, when you're writing apps, what are you writing to? You know, do you, do you need a compiler? Do you need to know all of that? You're, you know, maybe you're writing apps because your environment is a browser, not an operating system. Your, your environment is a Java virtual machine, not an operating system, right? The environment's what you write to, to do what you do, just change. So, you know, that's kind of what these are all about, right? They get interpreted languages now more and more and more. Um, we talked about this a lot in 4450, but um, declarative languages. What that means is languages where you don't actually tell it how to do anything. Okay? Like HTML. Anybody think of HTML as a language? And okay, what's the L stand for? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Markup language. It's a language, but it's a declarative language. It doesn't, you don't tell it how to do anything. You know, I mean, if you do want to start doing stuff, you got to bring in other stuff that's not HTML. You know, for the most part, um, you just tell it, "I want some stuff, and I want uh, a header over here, and some stuff over there, and a link over here, right?" And, and you don't tell it how to do it. You just tell it what you want. Um, so there's just increasingly decoupling. One of the other interesting things: anyone familiar with um, with a thing called phone gap technology? Have you ever played with that at all? So this, this, it's an interesting thing, just for your cultural literacy. Um, the idea is uh, you're trying to write a, a smartphone app, and you want it to be kind of like cross-platform. You'd like to run on Android, you'd like to run on iOS. Um, and it's a lot of money to get like a native iOS programmer, native Android programmers, right? So what PhoneGap does, and it uses some other open source stuff called Cordova and some other things, but the fundamental idea is that the plugin has essentially an embedded browser for iOS and or an embedded browser for um, Android that are invisible to anything. If you're not like opening a browser and typing whatever. But there's like this shell of browser that's invisible to everything. And then you just use CSS, which is cascading, cascading style sheets, JavaScript, and HTML. And with that as your thing, you write the program to behave and to act whatever. You couple those with the little embedded browser, it puts a smartphone wrapper on it, and then it just sticks it on your phone as an icon. You tap, and you got an app. And it's looking and acting like a smartphone app, but it's actually HTML, CSS, and JavaScript running in an embedded browser that you can't see. And so your code doesn't care what it's on. If it's on an iPhone, if it's on an Android device, different embedded browsers, but you've written to essentially a browser interface and you get that portability. So this kind of thing, even for like, think smartphones, you think you're kind of down at the, a little closer to the hardware. That's increasingly the case, okay? Um, and one other thing too, because we're not really gonna go deep, well, we're not gonna go into it at all, 
But Java, one of the revolutionary things that Java did in the 90s when it came out, Java showed up when I was in grad school, which is weird, but it's true. It didn't exist before that. Um, was that the, the web had shown up to become a thing. And so the, the idea of portability was suddenly a concern. I wanted to be able to download stuff that could do things, right, from some random website. But you were going to download that to all different kinds of, of platforms, right? People running different hardware, different desktop. Oh, let me see. Oh, never mind. Let's say something about laptop. Um, you know, you couldn't rely on what the platform was that the stuff was going to come down to. So how do you, you know, just go deliver the right piece of software for the person on this version of uh, Windows and that version of whatever and this configuration? And the answer was, we're going to have everybody load a Java virtual machine called the JVM, and then all Java programs are written to interface to the JVM, not to other platforms, other hardware. It's really like a simulator, just like we're doing with the LC3. You do assembly language, and there's this kind of emulator. Same idea. The Java virtual machine just looks and acts to the program like a machine. Underneath that, it's got to hook into the actual iOS or Android or, or, or uh, uh, Windows or Mac or whatever. Uh, Linux. So the, the JVM has to still have these hooks that hook it into stuff, but the JVM environment looks exactly the same to all Java programs. That's the idea. So I could now, as long as everybody had Java, you could access my website, grab my little active component. Everybody in the world could bring them down and run them, so you could run them anywhere. It was critical to a web environment. Until there was a web, there was no need for this kind of massive portability. Once there was a web, it was critical. And once again, we decoupled yet another layer away from actual hardware. So, so anyway, but that's just the flow of history, and so that's no way around that from the author's perspective. Okay. Um, the other thing, just, I'm going to just kind of roll. I'll ask some questions as we go, you know, here and there, but, but if you have any questions or whatever, just stuff that's nagging you, so please just throw your hand up and jump in. I really don't mind it. Um, you're not going to break my flow or whatever, or even if you do, I don't care. Um, okay, so let's talk about um, the idea of what we call a computer system, okay? Uh, and this is going to be, I don't know, some of this will be repeat for some of you, and some of this will be kind of new. Um, I don't know why I acquired a picture of a... CPU that looks like it went through the microwave <laughs> and then sat in a rusty dump for the 20 years after that, but that's what I found. And I don't even know what I was thinking at the time. It works for me, though. Um, we talk about computers, and then all the terms get kind of funky. The core of what a computer is is the CPU, you know, the central processing unit. We're going to get deep into it. Sometimes we call it a processor. Okay. Um, but it's really, it's really this over here, okay? That right there. The bulk of the real estate, when you start carrying chips apart, the bulk of the real estate is the space it takes you to run little filaments out to the big feet that you can actually solder onto a board. That guy there, sometimes it's like tiny, tiny, but so many little filaments coming out to these little, they call these pins, pin outs, pin ins. Um, and this you have to be able to like set it on a board in some solder and it'll like, you know, stick there and now you can run power to it and get signals in and out of it. Um, most of the real estate is just getting to the CPU and not the actual CPU itself. Okay, but the integrated circuit that's living down there, tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, anyway, then we talk about computer systems, it's all the other stuff, monitors, keyboard and stuff. And then we munch the terms and we don't care. You know, it, it's really just fine. Um, but if you want to freak people out, um, just, you know, when, when you like, you need your phone, you're like, would you grab my computer for me? You know? And then they'll be like, be looking around because they're looking for your laptop or their, your desktop. Would be, it'd be odd to ask if you could, you know, give me the tower gaming machine that I've got, you know? But this is a computer in every, absolutely in every sense of the word. We just don't normally call it that. You can just have fun in a, in a if that's the level where your life is at, if that's... <laughs> I would recommend it, you know. Friends, you don't care about. Okay, that's it. That's that's the interlude on computer system. Okay, just just understand it, you know. So the other thing too is some of you uh, have been doing the writing code since you were 12 thing, and that's cool. 
And some of you didn't really do anything until 1400, and that was like last semester. And there's, you don't know anything. So just understand that both of those are cool. There's a certain inherent advantage when you've just been living in the space, so don't worry about it. You know, you know who you are, and then for everybody who knows you aren't that, don't worry about those guys, okay? That's fine. They're, they're living their life, you're living yours. And there's so much room to still kind of grow, learn, understand stuff, start from scratch. It's totally cool. You don't, you don't have to be the, the one who was raised, you know, with whatever processors hanging from the mobile in their crib or whatever. You know what I mean? Whatever. Mom and dad were soccer. Um, so seriously, if you've only had 1400 you don't know much, we're going to baby step it all the way up. And you'll know cool stuff when you're done. And don't be intimidated. Just, just latch on and go. <coughs> you'll, it's remarkable. You will, you will catch up remarkably fast. Okay, the next thing, these are kind of a little bit of random topics, but they, they kind of relate. Um, the notion of universal computational devices has been uh, a sort of a, um, kind of an elusive idea for a really, really long time. The, some of the earliest people that played in this space were Alan Turing, for example. Um, what was the movie with uh, Mr. Benedict Cumberbund? <laughs> the Imitation Game? Yeah, right. That's the story of Alan Turing. And uh, I recommend the movie. And uh, Benedict West Bucket is really a brilliant actor. He's a, he's a new name. He's a second name. Name adjustment, name surgery. But uh, anyway, uh, it's been an elusive quest, okay? And uh, there's a lot to say about the history. We don't really just don't have time. Maybe when we get to the end of the class or something. But there's a couple of ideas that relate, you know, kind of foundationally to this whole idea of, of computing systems, okay? And, and one of these is analog versus digital. You've heard the terms, right? You've heard the term analog and digital. What I want you to do is, is come away from this section with a bit more of a concrete understanding of what that really means. And, and I don't, I really don't want you to come away fuzzy. Like, so digital is like uh, computers and analog is like, you know, I don't know what. You know, I, I want you to really have a very clear, concrete delineation in your mind of what these two things are. And this is always an exam question. It's always a module one exam question. And so I'm gonna kind of just try to walk through some ideas here and, and try to track me. And if you're not giving it, persist, okay? Be a little persistent about you know, it's still not coming clear, and I'll try to hit it. At some level, we'll saturate and we'll say, let's talk offline. Off but um, let's talk about analog systems. Uh, analog systems are they're they're continuous is one thing that we say. They're they're really kind of natural. Um, a great example, classic mathy example of continuous system is the real numbers, okay? Now, there's a, there's a risk here. Computer science kind of came out of math in terms of its, you know, uh, pedigree. But the reality is that a lot of the CS topics really don't have as much to do with math as we like to let on. And we, we claim it's more intense. And so we tend to use a lot of mathematical concepts to illustrate our CS things, even though they're really not mathy things, okay? I'm going to start with the real numbers because it is a really good example, but I'm going to try to springboard to something else. The real numbers, as you remember from whenever the heck you study that stuff, um, real numbers are all the numbers, including everything. Let's let's just do let's just talk about real numbers versus integers, okay? And that'll kind of give you a little bit of this distinction as kind of a starting point, okay? And as kind of a spoiler, this is continuous, and this is digital or discrete, and I'm gonna kind of use those two somewhat interchangeably, okay? Continuous or analog, they kind of go together, all right? 
Um, there, we tend to say digital. You know, I have a digital system. We don't usually refer to discrete systems unless we're like discrete math, discrete structures. What does that really mean? We don't usually refer to our computers as discrete systems, but we have no problem saying it's a digital device, right? Found, sounds computerish. Um, let's see, what are the integers? Uh, let's start, there's, there's a bunch of negative numbers, and then there's zero, right? And then there's one, and then there's two, and then there's three. And in the integers, what's between zero and one? Nothing, dead space, or no space, whatever. And it just, you know, it keeps going. It's infinite in both directions. But there's nothing in between. You're just stepping, right? There's a three, then there's a four, there's a five, there's a seven, there's an eight. You give me an eight and a nine, I know exactly where the line is between those two, right? In the real numbers, let's go zero and one again. You know, what's between zero and one? How many, how many real numbers are there between zero and one? An infinite number, right? And the reason there's an infinite number is because I got, I got 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, right? And I can do a bunch of those. And you're like, okay, that didn't seem so bad. How many numbers between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2? An infinite number. Because I can go 0 0.11, 0 0.12, et cetera, et cetera. And I can stretch that out as far as I want to go. And essentially what I'm doing is just carving up the space finer and finer and tiny and tiny and tiny and tiny. And if I just go tiny, this is, this is my imitation of tiny spaces with a pink highlighter or whatever, right? And no matter how fine I get that spot, there's another way, I can always split it, like split it and split it and split it and split it. There's, you know, there's no limit to how often I can do that, right? And so effectively what winds up happening is in the real number system, there is no space, there's no space between zero and one in the real numbers where there isn't a number. Doesn't it, which is a weird concept, but you know what I mean? There's no space in there where there isn't a number. But there's always space in between, you know, zero and one. There are no numbers between zero and one in the integers, okay? So, <clears throat> generally, we, we kind of view continuous and discrete as sort of being, uh, you know, antonyms, sort of opposites, okay? And then we sometimes will, you know, talk about analog versus digital, continuous versus discrete. That's usually how we kind of line those up, all right? So what I want to try to do is, is you know, operationalize this a little bit and, and help you to kind of see, let's get away from math, okay? Get away, let's talk about the real world. Um, some systems, what do you, as your mind's going, you know, think about systems that you're dealing with that are, you know, they're continuous. I think what works for me are like analog clocks, where there is no, you know, it's continuous the way the hands move, and then digital clocks, where they increase and decrease by specific increases. Yeah, no, and, and it depends, it depends, right? Because um, what you're talking about is like where the second hand goes, click, Click, like that one's doing it. It's going click, click, right? It, it's like I'm here and I'm here. The only dicey part about that is number one, if there's a microprocessor driving that thing, then it's all a charade. You know what I mean? The thing's like, it's a, it's a, it's a discrete system that's putting on like a Halloween costume, you know what I mean? And masquerading as a continuous system, whatever. The, the, the true continuous, and I don't know, that, that's got to be digital. I mean, it's got to be a, a, a little processor underneath running the thing. The other struggle is you're here and it's like I pause and then I click, right? And what happens during the click from here to click when the second goes? It, it still passes through all those locations. It passes through an infinite number of, of spots. Even when it's like, it's just like waiting in between. The timing's off. I wait. I pass through the infinite spots, I wait, I pass through the infinite spots. As opposed to, I am constantly at a steady rate passing through all the infinite spots. And that's the only struggle I have. And the other, the other challenge is, um, when we say, if we leave it at sort of like clocks with a face are, are, are continuous, they're, you know, they're uh, analog and, uh, you know, the digital alarm clock is digital, you don't understand the delineation. You don't have it 
clear enough in your head. The old classic wind up the clock, the Swiss watch, the classic whatever, these are just gears and the timing of everything is in the size and the shapes of the gears. And, and you wind it and it's just going, you know, things are moving and, and the whole thing is just in a very continuous and smooth motion. And the second hand, they call it sweep second hand. And the second hand is moving smoothly because behind it is nothing discrete. It's just gears moving the, the mechanism in some magic. I don't know how they do it. So this is Switzerland. With this yeah. plug, even though the second hand's moving and like a discrete motion, can we say that the minute hand and hour hand are uh, analog in this case? It depends. It depends. So, and I want to, yeah, the problem is just that it's fraught with peril until we really understand it in another way. Mm -hmm. So one of those, I want to pause that for a second and kind of, we can come back to it, but um, I want to pick some other things. What just, and let's just brainstorm. What other things are either they're your idea or you might be like, well, I have, an, I have a question, like what about this or what do I think about that? Oh, I was just saying the book um, was doing a weight scale, for example, of an analog. Okay. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, like, you know, but it is a whole bunch of real numbers, and no matter what you put on, you take it off, it doesn't really continue unless you put weight on. Yeah. So let me, let's talk about the weight thing, okay? Um, there are really two different kinds of weight scales, right? One of them, you've got the little sensors and whatever, and, um, and you get on it, and then there's a bunch of calculation, and then it spits out, right? 173.8, and that's clearly not your weight. You have a weight, it is clearly not gonna round off to the nearest tenth in the real world, right? Your actual weight is some infinite precision, you know, 175.823559, pretty soon pi's in there somewhere, and then there's like, you know, and it just goes, that's your actual weight. If you could really, it's an infinitely precise value. And then the digital one just kind of starts from the beginning, does some stuff, approximates, gives you a number, you walk up, feel good about yourself. The spring-based scale, right, there's, and I'm talking about the ones that don't have a reading, that don't have a readout, right? Um, the spring-based, the old-fashioned ones, right, where you could bury the needle, you know, if you were, if that Thanksgiving got a little out of control, um, right? But you step on and you feel the thing go spraying underneath you, right? And as you, and as you spring, you can see the thing kind of move, and you realize that the needle on the on the thing is tied to some mechanisms underneath that are reacting to pressure. So the whole system is continuous, right? The pressure being applied is infinitely precise and kind of unknowable, and that's transferring to the gears and to the springs, and this thing goes. And then when you're done with that one, you look down and you go, 175.8 and you step off the scale and what you walk away with is a discrete value right because you rounded it and and grabbed a value that you could get your head around you can't walk around with infinite precision anything nobody has that much memory in their phone or whatever um what's the temperature in this room Can it be known? Can it be known? Yeah. By not God. <laughs> it can be approximated, and no one's arguing that one. Can it be known precisely? No, no, absolutely not. And and I'm not even talking about can the locate can the temperature if we put a single thermometer in a certain location we can argue that location itself cannot truly be known because it has an infinite level of precision, right? It's 71.528335 blah, blah, blah degrees, and it can't be known in practice. But even if we, even if we just grant an approximation to the nearest digit decimal, how many individual temperatures are there in this room? If you measure them all. How many? Infinite, right? Every microscopic iota in this room has a unique temperature different from every other temperature in the room. And I'm not even talking about 
once you get to like, you're here, you're here, you're in my face, you're in my head, you know what I mean? You're in my sinuses, you know, oh, 98.6, very healthy. You know, you're in the back, you know, you're, I'm not even talking about inside our bodies and all the other, you know, things and whether the pop you've got is cold or your fans kicking on your laptop, I'm not even talking about that. Just the airspace, there's so many different locations, right? So what we do is we, we take something like a thermometer, we set it in a room somewhere in some representative location, we look at it, and then we say something like, this room is really hot. It's like 76 degrees in here. And we're okay with that approximation. It means something to us. We know it's imprecise, we know it's not accurate, but it's useful, right? There's, you know, all data's flawed. Somebody once said, all data is flawed, some data is useful, all right? All algorithms are flawed, some are useful. All stats are flawed, some are useful. Okay, this is the key. The temperature itself in this room is a continuous function. It's continuous, it's analog, okay? In nature, the temperature is, is analog. When we put a single thermometer in a room, measure it, round it to the nearest tenth, and say it's 76.8 degrees in here, we have just performed a transformation on continuous data and have generated a discrete value. Okay? That's the difference. That's the key. So in other words, discrete values, <coughs> for the most part, don't actually exist in nature. We fabricate them as a sort of a social contract with ourselves. We say, you know, the proper human body temperature is 98.6. So it's a convenient contract that we make, okay? So this, I think, is one of the really key ideas, that the world is continuous, the world is analog. Here's another example. Um, and, and what we do, I'm gonna throw another vocabulary word out there for you, because it relates, and it relates to this word discrete, and, and the, the word is discretize, uh, normally, the accent is discretize, uh, as opposed to discretize, which sounds like something to do, you know, with your eyeballs. Uh, but anyway, discretize. This refers to the notion that you take this some continuous thing and you sample it in some way that you can make sense out of and do something with. Okay. So. Um, What's an example? What's an example? Uh, there are many. Actually, where's my... Here's a good example. Something that they actually do. So here's my question. This is a... How many of you have seen something like this before? You kind of have some sense of what that is. Uh, a few of you. Um, the rest of you were indoors you know, coding and such. Uh, <laughs> but what they do is they want to know what, some, what an athlete's vertical leap is. Right, and when you're doing like NFL combine, uh, you know, you're whatever. You're doing a workout for an NBA team, whatever. They want to know what your vital stats are. Can you run the forty? You know, how fast are you? Whatever. And one of the things are, uh, one of the things is that they want to know what your vertical leap is. So, the way this thing works is, um, they calibrate this thing to start with with basic, with basically like you know a reach. Like, what's your when I stand there and I stretch out, you know, how high can I reach? Then you get ready, you jump, and you whack the, you whack the little, the little, what are these, like, like little, tile things? what do we call it, little tiles, whatever, I don't know what we call those things. Um, and then I can, you know, that was, the, that was the difference, right? I bring it down to a certain level, and it's the bottom, and I gotta get up there. What's this guy's vertical leap? Do, does, when you're done, do you know? Well, I'll put it this way. When you're done, do you have a number? Do the NFL scouts have a number? Yes, yes they do. And, and it's going to be, and I think the way this thing works is, if I'm not mistaken, um, I think every one of these is a half an inch. Does that sound right? Yeah. I think that's it. And so you can get to like, oh, I got a 32 and a half inch vertical leap. I got a 33 inch vertical leap. You know, but it's going to be on a half inch granularity. That's a discrete system. Okay? 
There is nothing between 30 inch vertical leap and 30 and a half inch vertical leap. There is no, no one gets to live in that zone. There's one bucket for that. Everything between that falls into the same bucket. Okay? If I get up high enough and flick that one, I just enter the next bucket. Whatever one I flick, I'm in the bucket above it. Done. That's called discretization. I've sampled in a continuous system. From an analog perspective, from a true continuous function perspective, do we know what this guy's vertical leap is? Cannot know. Cannot know what the actual vertical leap is. So again, we're discretizing in order to create an approximation because it's not accurate, but it's within a half an inch. I mean, we do know it's within a half an inch of accurate. And frankly, if it's a 24 inch vertical leap versus a 34 inch vertical leap, I'll take the guy with the 34 inch vertical leap. You know, and I, and I don't need to know, you know, oh, was it 30, what was the precision on that? Don't care, because it's good enough for what it is I'm trying to explain, <coughs> okay? So you get this idea, if we, if we had like um, a bunch of doors and they just have like, there was like a three foot door, a four foot door, a five foot door, six foot door, seven foot door. I don't think anybody here is over seven feet. And the idea was you just had to like walk up, start at the bottom, walk up. If you don't fit, you go to the next one. You look, if you don't fit, you go to the next one. And if you walk through without ducking, that's your bucket, right? What bucket am I going to be in? Seven foot tall, baby. Seven foot tall, because I'm over six foot tall. I would not fit through the six foot tall door unless I duck. So I'd be in the seven foot bucket with everybody else in this room that was over six foot tall. That's, that's pretty coarse grade, okay? It, but it's an approximation. We take a continuous function. If we, lie, if we stacked every one of us up and tried to see who, you know, what the heights were, we could perfectly do it and it would be, a, it would be some thing, right? And if you think you're the same height, you're not. There's gonna be some difference. And depending on the day, how you sweat, spinal compression, blah, 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 hair height, <laughs> day, whatever, you know? Bad hair day, you pick up a half an inch. Um, Okay, you got that idea? So here's a practical example that you, that you play with. Um, we're, I'm talking, right? What kind of a system is it? Me talking, you listening, you hearing, right? Your eardrums are perceiving sound coming out of me. My vocal cords and my you know, speech system is generating sound. What kind of a system is it? Analog. Right, it's absolutely analog. And one of the reasons you know it's analog is that there's no, there's no discretization. So the, what I would do is just start with the assumption that everything is starting off analog. And that it stays analog unless you discretize it. Because nature doesn't usually hand you discretized chunks. You know what I mean? It gives you a plot of grass with some odd crazy number of, of you know, grass cells and not like 12 donuts in a box, you know, we do that. You know, we discretize the world. The world doesn't usually just give us 12 donuts in a nice clean package. If, for example, biologically, your brain takes like number of samples per second for sound, would that be a discrete system? That's, that's a beautiful question. That is, that is a fantastic oh, question. How exactly you want to get? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Well, but, and then let's actually, let me pause on that one and I'll come back to it because retina is a better example. You know what I mean? And here's why. Uh, well, and they're still good examples. They're both good examples. I, I do this thing and I set, up, I set up sound waves, right? And they're compression waves. And I can do the same thing by just going, you know, I, mean, I, I can only have to do it with my voice. I can just set up sound waves, right? Apologize for that. Hostile disruption. Um, creating a hostile environment in the classroom. Sound is created, right? Travels through compression waves, through the air, hits our eardrums, right? And then to magnetic membrane, that starts to vibrate. Is that vibration continuous or discrete? Continuous. continuous, right? And then sitting on top of this is the most freakish thing. The tiny little bones, tiny little bones, you know? And they're all like hooked together in this elaborate little Lego structure, right? That eventually, and, and, what, and they're all vibrating. They're all moving through the system. It's insane, okay? Continuous or discrete? Still continuous, right? And then there's a point at which it gets picked up by the auditory nerves 
right? They're like, I don't even know what it is. It's like a big coax cable. I don't know what it is, you know? And then when it, okay, this is the part which is really kind of getting to your, to your question. Now it's picked up by the nerves, continuous or discrete. You know, and I'm going to kind of maybe go discrete at this point. It's big discrete. I mean, it's a lot of, sampling is a lot, right? The better one is the eyes, the retina, okay? Because in your retina, um, you have these rods and cones, and they're, they're, you know, they're situated across this surface, right, on the back of your eyeball. I learned a lot about this because I have a son who had three retinal surgeries last semester. It, it was not, a, academically, it was not a great semester. Um, fortunately, there's a thing called incompletes, but his retina detached at the end of the summer. Like three quarters, you know, it's like, whoo! And anyway, and then they do this operation that I think of as welding raw bacon to steak. You know what I mean? Thank you. Thank you. And then, you know, and then hoping to pin it in place uh, long enough for it to like, mm, you know, stitch and stay. Yeah, insane. So right now, this is true, as long as we're on this one, this is so cool. The last surgery had the third one, another repair on the retina. There was a cataract surgery in the middle of it because when you expose your, your optic lens to, to the air, it actually will develop a cataract no matter how old you are. Um, so then you wind up having to do the cataract surgery. But when they're done, they fill the eyeball. And that's all so gross, right? Because it's just all like, I don't know, like mayonnaise. You know what I mean? It's like, what is that stuff? You're like, how do you stitch mayonnaise? I don't even know. Um, and it's really gross. And I know I could never be a medical doctor, you know? Like, ah, oh, I don't want your fluids, seriously. Um, anyway, so they fill, it, they fill it with a gas. And the gas is kind of opaque, so you can't see really, really well. And then the eyeball, the, the, whatever the things are, it absorbs the gas as it produces the little, I don't know what it is, vitreous fluid or whatever. So the eyeball is generating replacement fluid, filling itself up with fluid, okay? And as the fluid rises, you can, it, you see through that fine, so it's like, it's like gas you can't see, opaque gas, and, and happy, clear fluid. But, so, so my son has been going through this thing where it's like, hey Skyler, where's the line now, right? But the clear vision, it's filling up from the bottom, right? Because that's gravity. The clear vision is coming to the top because everything comes through your lens, reverses, and hits the retina in upside down. <laughs> oh, man. It's had nothing to do with 2810, right? But <laughs> anyway, yeah, so it's like, how are we doing? He's like, yeah, it's down, you know, it's like here. And he's at the point where it's like right here. He just closes the eyes, like, I can't, I can't, can't. no, we got to wait for a while. Okay, and here's the point. Is there a point? Yes. <laughs> How many rods and cones are there in the retina? A lot. a lot, a lot. That's a discrete amount, right? There is a fixed, finite number, big, really, really big. There's a finite number of rods and cones in the retina right? Cones which perceive color and the, and the rods which perceive movement and things like that. Um, okay, so in other words, there's that many receptors, photoreceptors, each of which then connects out through some nerve, through some fine little filament, the little pinouts, and then eventually goes back to a big coax cable in your head. You know, I don't even know, right? That, that in a sense is the light comes in continuous right, or analog, and then when it hits the retina, it's like a really, really massively high resolution camera. But it is a finite number of pixels. And every retina, every retinal rod or cone is like a pixel perception, right? So at that point, it really is, uh, it really is the screen, okay? Um, and that's why, I mean, anyway, but we do the same thing with pictures when we digitize pictures, right? You take that thing, you got a camera, a digital camera, back in the day, before digital cameras, you had real film, right? You had like silver nitrate or whatever the thing was. You would coat this stuff, the basic just go black and white, silver nitrate. It's a chemical, okay? Every molecule of silver nitrate material 
would basically become like a pixel, like a photoreceptor with a grayscale. And you would expose it, the analog light would hit it, and then it looked super continuous, but really it was also a finite, a very big number, finite silver nitrate molecules on the film. And you develop it and whatever. Anyway, you see where I'm going? So when we deal with things like, what's an MP3? MP3s, continuous or discrete? Discrete. Discrete, absolutely. Then you play the MP3 on your laptop through your crappy speakers or whatever, right? Through the earbuds or whatever. And then the sound comes out of the speakers. Now what is it? It's analog. It's continuous. Okay? So we're in this constant, weird... And that's why, you know, going back to the clock thing, it's a classic example in a lot of respects. But it, it just totally misses the subtlety. You know what I mean? It really, really misses the subtlety. Because in our world, we're really constantly transforming, you know, back and forth between continuous and discrete. So when you deal with something like, I want to make an MP3, I set up a microphone, it sets up the sound waves, there's things that detect the vibrations, it converts those into discrete digital signals, and then I can save those numbers. It's just numbers. I save the numbers, and then later on, by reading those numbers, I can kick it back the other way through magic. I can kick it back out the other side, and it'll be and it'll play as music out of the speakers. Okay. When I, it's easier to conceptualize pictures because it's like, you know, you, you probably say, I'll find one. I'll find one. I'll, I'll pull it up for next time. But where you you look at some image, and what you really do is like take okay a square, a square, a square, a square, and do the whole thing for the class. With each square, I kind of just go, what's the average color in that square? And I could do that in this room right here with maybe just like a few hundred squares, you know? So it'd be like, you guys would all be like one square, and you'd be, you know, one square. And what's the average color? And then when you kind of like fuzzed your eyes and pulled back, it would kind of look right, you know, weirdly. That's called digitization. And it's also a form of discretization. We're taking something that's analog and we're making it discrete. We're going to represent that with a single number, and that number is going to represent a color. That's all I'm doing. And that's why uh, in, the, in the days before uh, fast uh, Ethernet, you know, fast internet, fast Wi Fi, back in the days when it was like America Online uh, through a dial up modem, right, which makes the sounds of robots screaming underwater. Right? <laughs> and um, back in those days, you tried to load a web page. I'm talking like 1994, you know, it was very new. Um, you try to load a web page with some graphic, right? And what some of those browsers do, they still do it, um, is they'll grab the file and instead of trying to like read the whole file because it's going to take forever, you ever done the one where it's like, <coughs> if you're old like me, you remember this, you know? Or some of you grew up with like crappy internet, you know, in your house, right? With dial up mode. Um, you don't know I mean? but it'd be like, like the tiny little line of pixels growing, 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 then line two, you know what I mean? So what, what they would actually do um, to make it just a slightly better experience is they would actually pull not every byte from the, from the, from the graphics file in, in order, but they would like grab, I want this one, skip a bunch, that one, skip a bunch, and it would be like a representative sample. They would take that one and they would fill an entire chunk of screen with it. So you'd start with this heavily pixelated, but this still happens, right? This heavily pixelated kind of picture, heavily granular, and then it would like, sort of like, get better, get better, get better. That's because you grabbed a sample of those things and then just like filled the space. That one's all red, that one's all purple, this one's all whatever. And then as I got a few more samples in there, I do, I like refine it, refine it, refine it. And if, if you spread it out enough, you get the feeling that the whole picture is so like coming in. Instead of just sitting there waiting, <laughs> Not a great experience, right? Another great user experience. Does that all make sense? So that is discretization. That's why pictures become pixelated when you blow them up sometimes. This is now in 2020, this is blowing something up. Um, you ever try to do that with something actually physical? Like you have a magazine, you know, like when, that, when that's a thing, and you pick up you know, the magazine, you're like, you can't quite see the picture because you're old like me, and you grab. Is it just me? And you literally put your fingers on the paper and, and 
you can't catch yourself. It's going to happen in half a second. Before you can realize what an idiot you are, and you're like, huh? You're like, I hope no one saw that, you know? And then, then instinctively, you're like apologizing to the world for the stupidity, and then you scooch it back. You know, like, huh. um, yeah. But anyway, that's what that's all about. That's, that's some of the grand mystery, and it really strikes at the heart of discrete versus the analog. Okay? Um, I know that's a long speech for like, you know, one slide, two, um, but I just think this is a really central idea and it, and it ripples into a lot of other ideas too. When you think about how do you, you know, what about the set, what about MP3s, what about JPEGs, what about, right, all these things we deal with in computers that are representing the real world to us in some ways. You know, it's all really about this fundamental idea of continuous things in nature discretized, okay? And then one other thing too, I'll just prep you now. When you get, when it's module exam time, which you're all going to take, you know, because because put the fear in you or whatever. Um, module exam time, I'll ask you about the difference between analog and digital. Don't just give me a word. Like, don't just say clocks. <laughs> Wait, you mean that? Isn't that a song by Coldplay? You know, I mean, like, like, no, you're not helping me. I don't know what you just said, right? Talk to me, use your words, okay? Just, you can, there's no time limit, and I know you can take the exam again, but use your words, express it, you get all the points. You say, clocks, I'm gonna say, I don't know what you mean, that's a zero. I got a question. Yeah, yeah. So, please. could I say, like, uh, for analog, we could say, like, a flamethrower or something like that, or not, not, not analog, but di uh, digital? Uh, would be like a flamethrower, and the flames that come out would be analog, in a sense? If like, you said that, it would still be zero, because I still know what you're talking about. <laughs> I mean, that's true. <laughs> you know, like, for example, um, you know, if you say, in other words, the goal, this is, this is a good bit of advice for the rest of your academic career, which is, the goal is for you to take the opportunity to express to the, to the greater um, that you know something. And the best way to think about it is that you try to teach it. Teach it to your 14-year-old sister. You know, that's the cleanest way to consider. If, if you read it yourself and thought, if I were my 14-year-old sister, would I now understand what I didn't understand before? If the answer is yes, you'll get all the points. Right? So in other words, you could say, I had somebody be like, you know, well, continuous systems are like uh, weather. Well, okay, maybe, maybe not. I don't know what, you're, one word, no bueno, okay? I don't know what you're talking about. But you, what they were trying to say is, well, you know, that, that the weather is not really the same. You, know, you look at your app and it says it's 33 degrees in Alpine. That's not really true, you know? And, and but explain, explain so we can kind of see, you know? And I think flamethrowers are a great example. Sort of, depends. <laughs> I won't use it, don't worry. <laughs> no, no, I think you should. I think you should. You should just flush you out, should just flush out the explanation. That's all I ask. All right. Okay, uh, any questions on that? Is that kind of clear? And I hope I hope gives you some teasers about some of the cool things that relate to computers and what we do and why we do it. And there's one other thing I want to say. Um, I kind of hinted at it, but I want to make it really, really clear. And it's something we're going to come back to uh, again and again and again. And that is that in computing systems, um, it's all numbers. It's just numbers. It's nothing but numbers. That's why we talk about numbers, I guess. But it's all numbers. And the numbers mean whatever we want them to mean. It's a social contract. You know? If I open an MP3 file, I expect those numbers to, you know, uh, behave according to the social contract of the numbers within an MP3 file to represent sound in a way that's gonna make sense to me, right? If I take a JPEG file, just rename the, the, the extension to MP3, right? First of all, it's gonna puke for a whole bunch of reasons that are more time than we have. But if I did that and somehow persuaded it, it would be the most horrible sound, right? Because it's not actually a, that's not what those bytes were trying to be. That's not what those numbers were trying to be. So all numbers have a meaning that relates to the one we gave it, okay? It means what we agreed it would mean. That's it. There's nothing magic or, or you know, perfect about that. Okay.
Let's come back to Alan Turing. 1937, I was three years old. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I think my mom was, actually. Uh, so, Alan Turing, man, crazy, incredible, incredible intellect. And there's a few that we'll talk about. Von Neumann is one, Turing is one. Uh, phenomenal. Um, he really is, Turing really was the father of theoretical CS, okay? Um, and we're talking about like a decade before there was a digital computer. And, and this quest, the quest for computing machines, computing devices, right? And if you go watch, we'll set up like extra credit or something for like the imitation game. Um, but you're, right, you're trying to, if I can crack, you know, this Enigma machine slash code, right? Let's save a lot of lives. I'm going to end the war early. Huge, right? And uh, no general purpose computer, computers to, to play with. You know, you're stuck in the middle of World War II. So um, that, that going back to the 1920s, and then even going back to the 1800s, there was always this yearning for computing devices, computing machinery. And uh, what Turing did, he did a couple of things. And one of them uh, was that he created kind of a model for a universal computing machine. Uh, later on, you'll, you'll deal with uh, what is called a Turing machine. When, when, whatever the class is that you do, automata theory, um, I don't know, what is that one? Discrete math something, probably. I don't remember. I haven't been here long enough to know all the numbers, okay? But anyway, the Turing machine, it was kind of a universal, it was conceptual, there never was an actual Turing machine. You know, machine machine. It was a conceptual construct, okay? A thought experiment, basically. And uh, essentially, we can show that Turing's model, theoretically we can show, um, that Turing's model was capable of computing anything computable by a modern computer, which is a staggering result, uh, you know, whatever we're at, you know, 80 years later. That's a staggering reality. And it led to a certain, you know, some other things like that, that became conceptualized during completeness and some other kinds of stuff. But it, it's pretty remarkable um, intellectual achievement. So it turns out in the book, when the authors talk about, uh, author, authors, in the book, talks about uh, Turing machines. I, I find it crazy, crazy weak. Gloss over it, don't, don't, don't hang your hat on it. Um, but one of the things that Turing uh, conceptualized, and it really wasn't strictly part of Turing machines um, as an idea. Uh, Turing machine really was the foundation for state machines and finite state automata and things like this. But, but Turing had this idea of a black box, a kind of a model. And Essentially, it was just a way of conceptualizing that, imagine that I have this black box and I have some inputs, right? And the, it's a black box because it's opaque. I can't see inside of it, right? And the opposite that they'll usually talk about is either like white box or clear box, the concept being I can kind of see in and I can see the mechanism. Turing was like, no, it's opaque, you can't see in it, but I know what the inputs are and I know what the outputs are. And you can already immediately perceive this as kind of like, foundational to the ideas of software and computing systems, right? It leads to things like garbage in, garbage out, you know, whatever. This is really a dumb, dumb expression from the last millennium uh, that should be put away. Um, so you can dispense with that. If anybody, if any of your friends want to say this to you, or your parents or whatever. Um, but what Turing did was, was create a certain kinds of conceptualizations. There's some homework on the first uh, module that has you doing the, some, some things with little black boxes. Nothing mysterious or magical or like, I got another black box. It's just, you know, so don't be like, you know, freaked out by it. It's just trying to say, I don't know what's going on. It's just some kind of a transformation. You know, I know it's here and I know it's going to pop out the other side. That's really just it, okay? Um, anyway, and that's sort of one thing. The other thing that's important about this conceptually is that when we start getting into actual circuits, right, we're going we're gonna to dust off transistors. Start with those, you start to build up some stuff, you get some stuff, then if you'd like draw a box around that and make the box opaque and just think of that as a, you know, whatever, a little circuit of some form, then I can stick a bunch of those together and if I put a box around that 
I can kind of build through abstraction. Eventually, I've just got, you know, my computer, right? My computing platform, which is really, from an abstraction perspective, just, you know, I can double click on this conceptually and I can see a bunch of boxes that interoperate. Take any one of those, double click, go down, and eventually I'm going to be down in transistors from a hardware perspective. Um, so this is just really an exercise, those black boxes are just an exercise to get you a little bit lubed up for circuits. So you're not as, as freaked out by the idea that I'm going to put, you know, draw a line around this now and just treat it as a thing that I know what it does. That's really all that's about. Okay. What do we have? Quartz Hill? We go to Quartz Hill, right? I'll be asking that for next month and a half, probably. So yeah, yeah let's talk about... Um, and again, any questions or comments, ideas, uh, arguments, whatever, you know, please don't ask it. How do you start with problems and wind up with electrons? How do you do that? That's what we're going to talk about next. And again, we're just trying to have a little more lay of the land and then maybe today, but certainly next week, we'll launch into transistors, which is going to, how many are just a little bit freaked out when I say transistors? Please be honest. No, it's more than, you're not, there's bunches of you are not being honest. I just want to say that. Um, and we still need to talk about the orders of ignorance and uh, have a lesson about honesty. Uh, <laughs> because I'm still freaked out about transistors and I actually know about it. I know what it is. I just want you to know that everything here is just, it tees it apart and it comes down to what the little things are. There's nothing crazy and mysterious. I mean, I lived through some crap classes, you know what I mean? As an undergrad and a grad student, this is nothing like any of that, okay? I had the stupid electromagnetics and all the other stuff. I still am resentful. Um, and this is nothing like that. Um, besides the fact, I'm still trying to kind of help you be software engineers. So I want you to just get an exposure, you know, get the exposure and a little bit of fluency so that you're just not afraid of it anymore. That's all I really want you to come out of here with when it's all done. You're not going to remember this. You're not going to be afraid of it anymore. And if you need to, you can kind of go back and double, double click on it. Okay. So we talked before about um, how we were going to, you know, start at the bottom, transistors, right, build our way up. And what I want to do now is just kind of take... That's one way to look at it. We're building the machine. The machine can now do this. Now the machine can do this. Now the machine can do that. Right? We work our way up. This is more kind of going the other way. This is where we're going to say, well, ignore all that. Let's just say we have a problem. What do we do? Now, if we have a problem, how do we work our way down to the point where transistors are our friends and can do a thing for us that we care about? Let's flip it and just... Take that in, because it's a different perspective, okay? The parts are kind of the same, but it's a different perspective. So that's kind of where we're going now. Um, and I want to just start, so there's our, there's our kind of uh, roadmap on the right, okay? And it starts with problems. Problems. Everyone's got problems. Um, the problem with problems is expressing them, right? You want to build, you want to start a company, you want to make a product, you want to make a million bucks, you want to do whatever you're going to do, you got a bunch of problems, you got a bunch of things to figure out, right? Um, what exactly is your problem? Well, that's really hard to express. Uh, natural language is notoriously ambiguous, okay? This is, some of you are going to confuse ambiguous and abstraction. I know this because I know this. And uh, so, um, Ambi. Uh, any, any other words you got that start with Ambi? Two or both. What? Oh, sorry, no. Uh, I, was the mean, I was thinking of the meaning of Ambi. Oh, yeah, yeah. But what but words that, that have Ambi? Yes. Ambidextrous, which means? Two hands. I can use both hands, right? Dexterous, same root as dexterity, right? Which is, which is manual dexterity, okay? And manual having the same Latin root as hand, mono. Um, so, uh, right. so if you have to, just the mnemonic in your head to keep them straight, ambidextrous 
I can use both of my hands sort of, you know, approximately equally as the two. Ambiguous, two or more meanings. You know, you give me an English statement or in any language you speak. And you give me a statement, and I'm going to just say, I got, you know, two or more possible interpretations. And this is really, really key, possible interpretations. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to see, you know, uh, that same way. Here's an interesting thing. You ever had this conversation with a roommate, spouse, friend, lover, child, dog? Um, you understand something a certain way, and you realize that they understand the thing a different way. That you there was a statement, but the statement could be interpreted in you know, two ways. And then you say something like, "Oh, yeah, no, I'm really sorry. I, I, I guess the statement was just ambiguous." And then they say, no, it isn't. <laughs> okay? Can I just say this? And if you're the one who did that, you know, whatever, like, you know, look inside yourself. You know what I'm saying? Um, the answer cannot be, no, it isn't. Unless the other person is completely irrational. I mean, they, they might be completely delusional. You know, I mean, like, out of touch with reality. And that's a possibility. Um, but, but barring, you know, barring extreme situations, um, if I say, I see what you just expressed, and I guess to me that, that meant this, therefore, it's, ambi it's ambiguous because it can be interpreted in two or more, reasonably interpreted in two or more ways. And the other person is not in the rules of engagement for the other person to say, no, it's not, it's not ambiguous at all, it's perfectly clear. Okay, then I guess I'm just an idiot because I see it a different way. And you're not saying, therefore, I'm right, or you know, that's not even the point at this point. Right? You've had, you, is that just me? Has anybody had this conversation? With my wife. Okay. You don't have to make that confession. Okay. <laughs> and I, I assure you I've been having that conversation with my wife a lot longer than you have been having it. <laughs> um, right? So the, 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 the point is that ambiguous statements are, by their nature, possible to be seen in two different ways. So, um, one of the module exam questions is just going to ask you to just, just as an exercise to think about ambiguity, cough up an ambiguous statement. Yeah. And you'll just be thinking about that. And I think the homework also kind of like preps you on this one a little bit. Any, any ideas? Anyone want to hazard uh, something? And say, wave at the man with one hand. Excellent, right? That's, that's sort of like, like a grammatically ambiguous one, right? Mm -hmm. Wave at the man with one hand, right? And I can clearly grammatically parse that one of two ways, right? Way that you're going to use one hand as opposed to two, or you're looking for the man who has only one hand, that's the one you're going to wave at, and your own waving is, is indeterminate in terms of what the spec is on that. Yeah, that's, that's a perfect, perfectly grammatically ambiguous, and, there's, and when you get into, um, man, you know, language is tough, right? I mean, you... Ah, uh, English. What's that? Ah, uh, English. Yeah, yeah. What is it about English? Why do we park in the driveway and drive in the parkway? That's my question. <laughs> okay, so just understand that when you start to, the reason for that exercise is that when you start to say, hey everybody, we're going to uh, solve a problem. We're gonna build a company. We're gonna do a certain thing, right? You have to kind of articulate that, write that down. So here's an example. Um, there's a company I know Whose product we used at this university, whose, uh, uh, whose in my writing, it rhymes with Canvas. And um, <laughs> so the spec, when they, it was, it was founded by one of my former students at BYU, um, him and another guy. The spec was, when they started the company, the spec was basically Blackboard sucks, no investor can argue with this, right, if they were ever in college. And Blackboard did suck. I'm saying did because for me, dead. You know what I mean? Black hole, may it rest in peace. Okay? Blackboard, as I sometimes call it. The spec was blackboard sucks. I think we can do better. And I think there's a lot of universities ready to, to just roll over and grab a different solution. That really was the business model, essentially. And they've executed fairly well. And for all of our grumbling about Canvas, it is kick butt still way, way, way better than what Blackboard was. And I lived with Blackboard for 15 years at BYU. Okay. Um, 
So you're gonna start a company and that's your that's your spec. You know, is that is that good enough? You know, did you say anything that could be misconstrued? Are you writing things down? Are you misunderstanding each other? Are you talking past each other? You know, you get business partners and good friends even, people you really love and you care about and you have trust in and everything else, and you just waltz into these situations talking past each other. Mental models are wrong, right? You try to write these things down, you try to articulate it, try, and, and it just is really, really hard, okay? And so when you try to state a problem, you've got to do what we call disambiguating, okay? This, you know, there's the ambigu ambiguity, so disambiguation is removing the ambiguity, making it clear that what it says really only can reasonably interpret it, be interpreted one way, and you both understand and everybody understands that's what it really, really means, there's no confusion. One of the things that I do um, as a consultant, when I come into uh, uh, companies to, to look at software process, for example, one of the things that I really, really love doing is like coming into an organization, maybe there's like 20 engineers in this organization, and, uh, and you're gonna interview everybody in the organization. And what I love doing is you grab each person and you just ask, them. the lead question is, why does your organization exist? Right? What's the purpose for your organization? And you just write them down or you record it, right? Or what does your company do, right? What niche does your company fill in the world? Why should your company exist? And you start, and you know that if there's 20 people, you're gonna get like 25 answers, right? You no, know, you're gonna find that, that the concept of what it is they're all doing, and that's a source of so many, you know, divergences and problems, you, that you really haven't articulated that clearly what it is we're really trying to do, and everybody's not on that same page, okay? So you have got to disambiguate the requirements. You've got to disambiguate. Then when you can finally understand what the problem is and disambiguate it and articulate it, now you've got to figure out, okay, but how, now how do we solve it, right? And that kind of comes down to algorithms, okay? Um, and I think you all know what algorithms are by now. And here's an example of the cost of ambiguity. This is a real story, the Mars Climate Orbiter. Uh, uh, you know, launched by NASA, December 11, 1998. And uh, almost a year later, this is 20 years ago, um, is my math correct? <laughs> yeah. No, more than 20 years ago. Uh, after a year of watching that thing fly toward Mars, it burns up upon entering the Martian atmosphere. Ouch. Cost three hundred and thirty million dollars. You know, I mean that's one NBA contract today. I get it, but I'm saying back then that was real money. So what happened? Here's an actually a little punchline here. There were two organizations. Lockheed Martin was involved. NASA was involved. There was uh, some calculation somewhere in the in the system, in which the code produced. This is just a software. This was a requirements bug. It was, a, it was a defect, but the defect was in the requirements, in disambiguating the requirements. 330. And there was another one that followed right on the end, of, right on the te heels of that, and I think there might have been a third one. And then there were like congressional hearings about shutting down NASA. So I mean, the stakes were quite high, right? Lockheed Martin was having creating software that was producing results in pound four seconds, which is uh, something in physics, I guess. And NASA was consuming data from that module in Newton seconds, which is again a thing in physics, as I perceive. Um, anybody see a problem here? Uh, it turns out that the specs that they had was just like produce, you know, uh, calculate the force. And the other was like, you know, you're going to receive a value. It's going to represent the force. And, and it came down to uh, some yeah, 50, 50 chance of blowing that thing up on the Martian surface. They, you know, they guessed right, I guess. That was the goal, right? You see how just that, that, that one little bit of ambiguity? And this is, and okay, NASA knows how to make software. So does Lockheed Martin. Okay, these are good organizations. And you know, how does that happen, right? I mean, it, it's just, it's a thing. Okay. That gets us to algorithms, which um, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. This is my view of algorithm, okay? Because um, I know I know kind of what 1400 says. I've been going through the uh, the, the book, Python book, 
I don't really like their definition of algorithm as much. To me, um, and these kind of come in the book, algorithms are a set of rules, right, that defines a sequence of operations. Uh, it's not the same as code. To me, code implements an algorithm. The algorithm articulates the approach. Yeah? So to me, the, an algorithm is a conceptual articulation of how you're going to do this thing. Okay? Like if you want to start a company and you're like, okay, well, we got to get to, uh, you know, 300,000 bucks in revenue in the first 18 months, we're dead. Right? That's the problem to stay alive financially as we start our company. So the algorithm would be okay if we can, you know, contact these companies, convert this percentage, right, ship this thing in this amount of time, make this many sales, right? You break it down. And that, that sort of approach of how you're going to strategize and go, that's an algorithm. Okay? It's fairly, it's, it can be fairly detailed, but it is an articulation, a careful articulation of the strategy that you're gonna that you're gonna employ. Okay? And when it comes down to algorithms for code, like what's the algorithm to we talk about sorting algorithms. Right? And you can describe a sorting algorithm. Well scan everybody, look for the biggest one, and then swap with the first one and move your pointer. Right? That's not code. That's an articulation of a strategy. And then I can go code it and that's an implementation of my algorithm. Algorithm can be fairly high level, it can be really low level, okay? But it's a little bit like the Betty Crocker cookbook, you know what I mean? That's kind of an algorithm, right? Yeah, it, it's like, it doesn't tell you what color the bowl has to be, but it doesn't say there's a bowl for the dry ingredients, right? So um, the book says there are three requirements. I just want to just, you know, I disagree just a little bit if you've read this part. Um, algorithms, first of all, not strictly a computer idea at all, okay? Algorithm is a generic idea. Um, and um, that the book talks about finiteness, okay, effective computability, you know, maybe definiteness. And at the end of the day, Dr. K says, I don't really care too much about the books quibbling with what qualifies as an algorithm, okay? From my perspective, if you have a careful articulation of your strategy, that's an algorithm. You know, a careful articulation of how you would solve this thing, that's your algorithm. Then you can go implement it. And one way to implement it is with code. Okay. Um, now, you got the algorithm. You know what to do. You can Now you can code it. And then you need language. Okay. Some estimates suggest there's as many as 10,000 programming languages. You know, I mean, it, it's irrelevant at <laughs> some level, right? There's a couple hundred that actually matter. You know, and at least a dozen that you really need to understand. And um, another thing to just kind of understand about language that I think is relevant, because this is, we're going to get into assembly language. We're going to go machine language, assembly language. And in a sense, when we start building circuits out of transistors, that's another language, really. Because right? language is really just about things and then rules for combining them. You know, the things have meaning, and there are rules of how we combine the things to create more complex meaning. Isn't that what we're doing with transistors when we build circuits? We're just, things have meaning, we combine them to create new meaning. It's the same idea. So assembly language is, in practice, the lowest level of programming language you'll ever deal with. But for some of you, this is it. This is as low as you'll ever touch anything for the rest of your career. Some of you will be very grateful for that. Some of you will sob tears of loneliness after it's over. Not really, and I made the last part up. Um, but if the lowest language is, lowest level language is assembly, what's on the other end of the spectrum? What's, what's a high level programming language? Python. Python, yeah, I think. What would you put, what would you put above Python as in terms of high level? JavaScript. What's that? JavaScript? So like Lego. Maybe. Like little Lego computer. Like the Mindstorm? The Mindstorm, yeah. Yeah, the problem is the Mindstorm, um, I thought, by the way, I've actually conceptualized like doing this class on Lego Mindstorms. Seriously, talked about it. And Raspberry Pis for having conversations. Um, now the problem with that one is you're doing a lot of low level stuff. So you wind up being fairly low level. You know, low level, you tend to be like C is a very low level programming language. 
What? Like end user programming. Like we oh were yeah, we were talking. Yeah, we were talking about forty four fifty. How about like how about like writing Unity, coding, like using visual. Yeah, how about like spreadsheets? How high level is that? Anyone ever have like a mom or dad who is not a programmer who has done an Excel spreadsheet? Probably badly, whatever, right? I mean, is that or is that not a really a high level programming language that you get to access in, in badly? Okay, so we're gonna, uh, we're, yeah, we're out of time. So we'll pause here, we're on number 43. And uh, have a fantastic weekend.